I want to fess up that I am asking you to do something that is not only difficult, but potentially painful and often unfair. What do I mean by that? I mean this exercise of understanding the world from the perspective of the person you're trying to persuade. We already talked about how hard that is because they can't explain it to you. But it's also painful. Why is it painful? Because it forces you to look at your own views critically, if only tentatively, and for the purpose of analysis. And no one likes that. No one likes to do that. As I said, the person's worldview is tied up with their understanding of themselves, their place in the world, but so is ours. So is ours. My views on certain things are tied up with, with the way I justify my successes and, 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 and failures. And it's not easy to question the things that you've built your own fragile okayness around. So it's painful. And it's also unfair. What do I mean unfair? Because often it is the powerless who must use persuasion if they are to succeed. Powerful people can do what they want financially with political power, other kind of power. Persuasion, the necessity for persuasion, often falls upon the powerless. So what I'm doing is asking the people who are relatively powerless in particular situations to understand, empathize, if not actually sympathize, at least understand those people who they're trying to persuade, those people who are powerful and who may not be reciprocating. People who may not be making an effort to understand you, and I'm asking you to understand them. Unfair, painful, and difficult. Plus, one more thing. It can feel wrong. It can feel wrong to enter into the certain worldviews. I mean, do you really want to empathize with a, a racist or a, 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 a bad person? Doesn't that feel morally, it feels like you're corrupting yourself. Painful, uh, difficult, um, uh, unfair, and, and potentially morally problematic. All of those things. So why am I asking you to do it? Because it's worthwhile. And that's what we're going to talk about now. As difficult, as painful, as unfair as it is, it's worth it. It's worth it. difficult, as painful, as unfair as it is, it's worth it. It's worth it. And here's why. Not just because it enables you to persuade. That, might, that alone might be enough, right? Because we're trying to get things done in the world. We're trying to win lawsuits or change the world or move forward or make a deal or something. It, it, it might be enough. It might make it worthwhile just to point out that if you engage empathetically, you are more likely to succeed in reaching people. That alone might be enough, but there's more, much more. It's good for you. This is what I want to talk about now. It's good for us to engage. Now, we could frame that in terms of moral goodness and say that engaging helps what, what some call our moral perception, that it helps us behave better and make better, make better moral judgments. I don't reject that argument, but that's not my focus here. My focus here, to use the terminology, would be more eudaimonist rather than moral. In other words, I'm not here telling you you should engage because it's the right thing to do, or even because it'll help you do the right thing. Both those things may be true. And my moral philosopher colleagues talk about and think about both those things. But I'm a little more Aristotelian than Kantian, if I may put it that way. I don't claim to know 
or, even, or at least don't claim to argue here about what's right and wrong morally. I'm going to leave that to your grandmother and your rabbi and your traditions on which you draw. I'm interested in you thriving, living well and fully. That's what I mean, you diamondist rather than moral. I think that empathetic engagement of the sort that we pursue in an effort to be effective in our persuasion helps us grow and thrive. So I want to talk to you about why and how it's good for us, for our own thriving, to engage in this painful, difficult, and sometimes unfair practice of empathetic engagement with those we're trying to persuade. And the key, to put it in one sentence, is it helps us see the world better. And by seeing the world better, we can navigate it better ourselves in search of our own visions of thriving and well-being. Imagine, imagine if you had to navigate some rough terrain across a valley. And you could see a lot of it from the high point where you sit. But a lot of it is hidden to you, hidden from you. So imagine if you could send scouts over to the high ground over there, there, and there. And then they would all report to you what the terrain looks like from them. You would see stuff that you hadn't seen. You would have a better map of the terrain and you would be better able to navigate it. The terrain is not physical terrain we're talking about. It's a terrain of human thriving, of human needs and emotions and relationships. But the, but the analogy is the same, okay? The seeing that world and components of it from varying perspectives helps you understand it better so you can navigate it better. It's like you're sending out scouts to help you understand the world. And that does not depend on the belief that the particular people you're arguing with are smarter or have better eyesight than you. No, it doesn't, okay? As long as they see some things you don't see, okay? They could be limited in their understanding of what they see. They could be mistaken in their understanding of what they see. They could misinterpret what they see. But if you can understand from them what it looks like to them, then you have triangulated the ethical universe and you can navigate it better. You see what issues look like and you reveal to yourself aspects of it that you have missed. And you learn how things go with people by putting yourself in the shoes of others. Is that the only way? It's not the only way. Great literature can do this. Great literature can do this, can help you understand the terrain of human thriving a little bit better. Some forms of philosophy, psychology, social science can do this. I'm not saying it's the only way, but this is a good way because it's concrete, real, grounded views of real issues that help you understand the world. And there's more than that. Because in order to navigate the world, try to figure out what a good life is going to be for you, because that's what eudaimonia means, not a technical thing, just means you want to build a good life, a life you feel good about, a life that feels good and you feel good about. You're trying to figure out what that is going to be for you. It's not going to be the same thing for you as for that person, this person, other person. You've got to figure that out, so you've got to understand not only the world, you have to understand yourself. Empathetic engagement helps you do that too. It does. Here's how. Because... As Aristotle recognized, if you're going to persuade, you also need to persuade the person to listen to you, to trust you. Call this the ethos part. A logos, that's the logical structure of your argument, right? And then there, uh, and there's pathos, that's the emotions and feelings to which you appeal. That's what we've been talking about. And there's also ethos, that is communicating to that person that you are a person that should be trusted in the relevant context, to whom they should listen. So you have got to understand not just what the world looks like to them, you've got to understand what you look like to them. Every person you argue with becomes a mirror on yourself. It becomes a brutally honest mirror. Because if you lie to yourself about what you look like to people, you're not going to persuade them to trust you. So it's a, it's a 
truth serum self-reflection mirror if you're really trying to persuade. And that is hard. We don't always want to confront the way we look in the eyes of others. I know I don't. What I think of as dispensing wisdom, I have to recognize other people see as tiresome mansplaining. <laughs> no one wants to face that. Okay, I think I'm being clever. Okay, somebody else is rolling their eyes because I told the same joke 10 times. I don't want to confront that, and those are just trivial examples. Okay, if I know that there's something I do that's morally problematic, and look, given the inequities of our society and our indirect complicity in it, all of us are living in glass houses. Okay, so it's hard to look honestly at ourselves. But that's what ethos requires you to do. Because if I'm going to persuade you, I have to understand how you see me. Now, I'm not saying, again, the point is not that the people you argue understand you better than you understand yourself. Some of them might. <laughs> but that's not the claim. The claim is that they will show you aspects of yourself that you haven't seen, that you don't want to see, that you have hidden from, right? Aspects of your own self and worldview that you don't want to confront. They'll make you confront it. So the practice of empathetic engagement is a process of seeing the world better and seeing yourself better. And the better you understand the world and the better you understand yourself, the better you can navigate that world in search of a good life for you. Then, yeah, I, use, I talk about Aristotle and I use words like eudaimonistic and everything else. It sounds like, well, Clark's got some kind of abstract theory. There's nothing abstract about this theory, okay? I'm telling you, you're going to figure out how to live, how to be happy. You need to understand the way things go for people and you need to understand yourself. Nothing tricky, nothing theoretical about that. And there are a lot of ways to do that, but one way is to honestly see the world and yourself from a range of different perspectives. That's a good way to learn about the world and yourself. And one good way to do that is by empathetically engaging with people that you meet. And persuasion motivates you to do that. The necessity of persuasion motivates the empathetic engagement, which helps you understand your world and yourself better so that you can thrive. Now, I want to add one more thing to this, because we mentioned that it can feel morally troubling, not just painful and difficult and unfair, but somehow almost wrong to enter into certain kind of views. And that leads to what is perhaps the oldest charge leveled against my profession, our profession, law, which is sophistry. You might think, wait a minute, is Clark telling me I got to abandon my moral commitments? You make, understand this argument, see it from their side, put yourself in their shoes. Is he preaching a kind of sophistry or moral relativism as a necessity for persuasion? No, I am not. I am not, not, not. Because you, not only can you hold on to your moral commitments, but it will strengthen you if you can do so. Now, I do think we should all be open to the possibility that we might learn something new. And the older we are, the more important it is. So I'm not dismissing the possibility, even the hope, that some of our views will evolve as we engage. But also, there are some views that you're going to want to hold on to, some principles of right and wrong that you just guide your life by. And you're not going to compromise them. And I'm not asking you to. Those can be your source of strength. There's a, there's a saying from the Talmudic tradition. And it says, if you want to take a man out of the mud, you cannot just reach in and pull him out of the mud. You have to go down in the mud, grab his ass, and carry him out. I'm not sure if that's exactly how the rabbi put it. But the point is, you got to get in there. Okay, so we, that's in effect what I've been saying about empathetic engagement. Get on in there. But why we don't do it is because it's scary. 
we're afraid we might get stuck. Oh, we're not sure enough to get in the mud because we might not be able to get out. Plus, it's going to stink and it's going to be dirty. We don't want to get in the mud. We're afraid. Well, your strong moral commitments, they can serve you like a big rope. You take that rope and tie it around your strong self and then tie it up around a big tree and then go down in the mud. Understand the world as that man sees it. Wrestle. Try to drag him out or persuade him out. But if in the end you can't, you can just say, sorry, man, I tried. I'm going to have to leave you here. And then you can pull yourself back out. So don't think I'm asking you to compromise or abandon your firm moral commitments in the effort of persuasion. I want you to hold on to those that are central to who you are. And use those as a source of strength so that when you encounter people, you can enter fully into their view without the insecurity and fear that so often inhibits us from understanding others and therefore understanding our world and ourselves in the ways that might help us thrive. You know, I could go on all year about what I'm talking about right now, about the difficulty, the importance and the eudaimonistic value of empathetic engagement. Matter of fact, in a sense, I do go on because that's the heart of what I teach as law professor here. That's the thread that runs through so much of legal education, whether it's my ethics class or my common law classes or my statutory based classes, this necessity, difficulty, and value of empathetic engagement and persuasion. So I could go on and on about that. But instead, in the next few episodes, I want to introduce a set of what we might call ethical concerns or things we should think about. Because if you get good at what I just described, as hard as it is, you're not done thinking about it. Because persuasion is a kind of power. And as Peter Parker's uncle said, with great power <laughs> comes responsibility. So in the next episode, we're going to turn a little bit to the question of to the extent that we can muster the persuasive power and eudaimonistic growth that comes from empathetic engagement, what are the considerations we should have in mind as we wield that power? Thanks.